Hello. Today, I'll be talking to you about how to organize your digital life in a privacy-preserving, machine-agnostic, and practical manner. And for myself, I am Zvezdin Pesarov. I am a student at University College London. And mostly, I'm a computer science researcher, so I do most work around blockchain, cybersecurity, and a little bit around machine learning. But I'm also kind of nerd about privacy and open source technologies, standards, and uh, freedom, essentially. And so, which is why what I'll be talking to you about right now is something I've had, I've, I've been researching as, as a side hobby for the past few years. And I would really love to share what I've learned and hopefully you can, you, you, you can take some experience out of this as well. So I will be focusing on privacy today, but privacy is a niche subject. It's simply the minority of people care about it. And as such, when you focus on privacy, you really, you definitely lose out some convenience and some com compatibility compared to people who don't care about privacy. So the solutions which I'll be showing you today will certainly make some compromises around that and you really have to care enough about it and you have to evaluate your risk, uh, your uh, cost to return ratio to see, if, to, to, to see if it actually, it is worth for you. And for example, you, you, sh you should be expecting some problems left and right. So uh, uh, for example, back at your, back at your password manager's database file uh, in, case some, in case something goes wrong. So let's say uh, the, the thing that I would like to focus particularly is not just about privacy, but about generally good organization of, of digital life. So that means I would like to organize everything, that, everything, every digital information that is of value to me, such that it is completely independent of the operating system I'm running of the particular software or yeah, of, 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 of the particular front-end applications that I'm using or of the particular hardware that I'm using it for. That means that, yeah, everything should be completely compatible with, with everything else. And if I lose out any single device of mine, I don't, lose any, I don't lose out any information. And I can simply access the same information that is of value to me from any device I, I want to. And it, it should also be private. So the key properties that I'll be looking for are support for end-to-end -end encryption, support for cloud synchronization, and mostly cloud first storage. That means that everything should be stored somewhere else. Um, maybe not in the public cloud, but still somewhere else, not, not on the particular local machine. And it should be easily accessible and synchronized, but possibly cached. And of course it should also be standard compliant such that it's not dependent on the, the existence of any piece of software. And so this talk, I'll be presenting you various open source technologies, which are adhering to these properties. Now, you likely know many of these, but the key value that I'm trying to bring here is uh, the experience that I've, the, that I've spent essentially trying out many different technologies and seeing that seeing whether their, their, their details and the compromises that they're making are actually acceptable for the properties which, are, which I'm trying to assert here, which, like I said, should, it should be completely independent of any hardware, software, OS, and, and things like that. So hopefully you still get to learn um, something new for this. Um, and another point is that while I will be focusing on privacy, I really want to put a great emphasis on practicality. So that means I shouldn't be making too much of a compromise in terms of uh, convenience and in terms of interoperability to get some more privacy. So they will be more private alternatives to the software which, I'm, which I'll be discussing today. And that's fine. If you want to use it, just use it. But I think more people w would be comfortable with a balance between practicality and privacy. So the main talk points there are about, um, so I'll be going over email, uh, calendar, context, tasks, uh, office, password management. And lastly, and the biggest topic that I'll be touching on and the most interesting one for me essentially is personal file storage. So how do you actually get all of your digital information that's of value to you, that's not email, calendar and office files, of course, that can be easily organized, accessible and has a scalable structure that can take, um, t that is uh, extensive enough such that if you ever want to store any new piece of information in the future, you still have a, a, a right place to store it. Like you, you don't need to change your folder structure or, or things like that. But first, let's, let's start simple in, with emails. So with emails, um, of course, the most widely accepted standard is to use IMAP. So as long as you have an email host that supports IMAP and you can use pretty much many different types of, of, of front-end applications that use IMAP and, and that's good. 
And on the privacy front, I uh, would simply recommend uh, using the widespread OpenPGP key. So if you aren't aware, OpenPGP keys are public private key pairs such that if you want to send an email to somebody else, you encrypt your email with your public key and they are able to decrypt it with their, with their private key. So you get completely encrypted end-to-end -end, uh, communication. Uh, the sad point is that most people, of course, don't use that. So um, um, you will likely not be encrypting most of your emails that you're sending, but it's, 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 still, um, it's still essentially the, the option that we have right now. And as for email host, I would personally re recommend mailbox.org. Now they aren't quite famous, but I've tried out many different email hosts in terms of features, sets, uh, cost, and uh, uh, compatibility with, with, of course, the requirements which I mentioned earlier on. And this one seems to be the most extens extensive. So they're completely standard compliant, meaning they, they, don't, they, they don't skew the IMAP, the IMAP standards, just like, for example, uh, unlike, for example, what Gmail is doing. Um, they have an OK spam filter. Uh, they support custom domains and they support uh, um, also C filters, which is pretty interesting. Uh, they also have their own PHP key server. And um, I think most importantly, they also automatically encrypt, if you want to, they, they automatically encrypt every incoming email uh, with your public PHP key. So, I mean, you still have to, they, they still have access to your emails because obviously they're coming in un, un, unencrypted if somebody is not using their PHP key, but they're encrypting it as, as soon as they, as soon as they get it and as soon as they pass it through the spam filter. So, um, they're not really uh, hold, holding any copies of the de decrypted manager messages, at least, at least, of course, officially. Uh, they're, they're also based in Germany, so it's, it's pretty nice as well. As, as for clients, I'm pretty sure the, the widespread Thunderbird just simply gets the job done. Um, just pretty extensive, has lots of features, um, works well. So that's, that's, that's pretty easy. Whereas for Android, I think Fair Email is an um, open source project that's really interesting and um, it's also very feature-proof, feature-full. Now, it, it, it can support syncing many different accounts at the same time. And my favorite feature that I haven't seen in many other places, including Thunderbird, is that it is able to automatically filter out tracking images such that it shows, it loads all, all the other images which should be normal and it simply hides the tracking images. So that's a pretty good convenience feature. But of course, if you, if you want to go more extreme, you can not load any images to begin with. As for uh, when you want to encrypt or decrypt keys with the, through, through, through Android, you simply have to have a keychain app that stores your private key and uses it for these operations. So open keychain is pretty much the, the default way to go on Android and it works well. And you, you, you can also use it with a private key stored in YubiKey. So if you have one of those, you can uh, decrypt or encrypt your emails through it. But of course, you have to have your YubiKey constantly in your computer or on your phone every time you want to encrypt or decrypt an email. So it might be too inconvenient for you, but there, this is an option. Cool. I would also like to mention ProtonMail as a pretty good, more privacy-focused alternative. Now, the, the, the problem with ProtonMail is that they're too privacy-focused and some for some people, the, this comes with more inconvenience costs, but if you want to go for it, just go for it. Cool, so uh, coming into the more interesting part. So calendar context and tasks, the, they're pretty um, the, they're pretty well, well known standards for these, CalDAV, CARDAV. Um, problem is that usually these servers are not written to support any kind of encryption. So obviously if, if, you, if you try, if you're not self-hosting your own calendar or context or task server, then it's, uh, it's, it's not really any, um, it's, it's not really good for, for, for privacy. So Etasync is um, an adapter that essentially is, is a server and a client that essentially allows you to synchronize your context tasks and calendars across any, any, any of your devices in an end-to-end -end encrypted manner. So they use their own protocol for communication between the server and the client. It's, it's not regular call DAF, card DAF, of course. And uh, it's, it's pretty encrypted and it also supports version control. So it doesn't simply update the current state, but it also says, you know, you added this contract, then you edited it and so on and so forth. So if something messes up, you can always go back. It's pretty interesting. I would like to also say that developer is pretty proactive. So he has always responded very quickly to my issues and helped, um, helped solve them. So 
Uh, he's currently, I mean, everything's completely open source. You can self-host it if you want to, but he's also selling, right? Uh, he's also selling hosting, so I would encourage you to support him on that one. Um, one minus that I can find here is because it's it, it because it is so convenient to use. Meaning, for example, at the sync when you set it up on your Android, it simply uh, is a, a native Android context calendars and, and tasks provider. So, given that pretty much every Android app asks for access to your context or calendars, you may not think that it's secure enough or private enough for you to store any valuable information in in these containers. In which case, you might want to use a more private alternative like ProtonMail's own calendars or, or contacts. But other than that, uh, it works on Linux, it works on iOS as well. On, on Linux, it, it local, locally hosts uh, a CalDAF and a CardDAF server. So you can pretty much use it with any, with any front-end you want and yeah, it works pretty well. Uh, as for very particular front-ends, I really like the the, the simple line of open source applications on Android. So simple contacts, for example, is a pretty good front end that just, just get the, just gets the job done for context. Simple calendar, same for calendar. Uh, it's pretty okay. Whereas for Linux, um, th Thunderbird Lightning is, is pretty much the default option, I think, uh, that pretty much most of you guys are using, I think, for um, for controlling your calendar and uh, accepting invitations through email and managing them left and right, of course. Um, for contacts, uh, Thunderbird also has an add-on called Cardbook, which can synchronize um, via Cards DAF to the, the local EdgeSync client, for example, and it also works okay. And uh, when we get to tasks, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So for desktop, we still have good applications for that are standard compliant and, and work with tasks. So for example, my favorite one is K-Organizer. Um, it simply supports the, the I, I think, the complete or pretty much everything around the task standard, and it simply gets the job done. The problem with tasks is when you get when you get to the Android side, I actually could not find any single application that supports the full task standard. So, the more widespread application I think is Open Tasks, and it supports most of the standards. So that means that you can still synchronize, for example, with EtherSync, and it works well. Um, but it does not support categories, it doesn't support subtasks, and the UI is not very config configurable. So it gets a pretty basic job done, but if you want to actually take advantage of the features that allow you to organize more tasks in the standard, that simply doesn't get that job done. Also, development is not, is, 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 is not particularly active as well. I mean, it, it is going on, but it's not very uh, active. So another alternative which I prefer is task.org. Now, um, task is, 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 is a lot more active and a lot more featureful than open tasks, but unfortunately it also doesn't support the, the full standard. What I mean by that is there's this one tiny feature that's missing, which is that tasks usually have a start date and an end date. Start date notes the date where you, can, where you should be able to start the task. And usually in open tasks, for example, if you set a start date in the future, it's gonna hide the task so that you don't see it because obviously you can't act on it. So why would you want to see it or clutter your menu if you have too many tasks? So uh, that one doesn't get synchronized with the, with, with the standard right now. So that's a, that's a, a, a bit of a bummer. So uh, if you want, you, you, can, you can help the developer by, by contributing to this particular issue. But otherwise, the UI is pretty great. And um, yeah, pretty sure this is, this is, going, this is soon going to become like the uh, default go to choice for any kind of task manager on, on Android. So what about Google Docs? Well, for me, Google Docs is very convenient. I mean, uh, module across, of, of course, the, the privacy concerns, it's really good to, to, co to collaborate with people in real time. And um, a nice alternative to that is, is Mailbox Office. Now they do support end-to-end -end encryption. So they have cloud storage and cloud, real-time cloud synchronization on, on Office files and they have a uh, they have a web ba web based front end that you can edit them, and it is it is end to end encrypted, but not when you collaborate with other people. So um, that's kind of a bummer. So I was thinking that maybe an interesting idea to extend to, to, to extend the field is to maybe develop a new open source project that essentially allows you to collaborate real time on Office documents um, using an end to end encrypted manner, and um, but so far, the most secure way to to handle your documents is to simply edit them yourself. 
for password management, um, the classic key pass is pretty much the most famous one. Um, key pass is usually written uh, is in traditional written for Windows. So a great implementation for Linux is a key pass XC. So key pass int introduces a, an open source database from format that uh, is as essentially data structure that can hold passwords. So key pass XC completely supports this. And it also supports many other different convenience features. For example, it supports two-factor authentication with UV keys, which is an added bonus for security, of course. Um, it's not that secure in a sense that you have a decryption password and the way the two-factor authentication works is that uh, you have you also have a, a, an additional private key stored on your physical UV key. And so you take uh, key pass takes your input uh, unlock password, passes it through the UBK, which gets encrypted and and, and, and then um, it unlocks with, with the return password from the UBK, which obviously doesn't change at, doesn't change at any time. So as long as it, as long as somebody manages manage, manages to snoop that it, it's over. But it's it's also a bit of a, it's also kind of convenient, so I guess make your choice here as well. And right now there's a small bug about uh, data loss in, in, in some edge cases that I found, but uh, should, should be fixed quite soon. And as for Android, um, the recommended application for that is KeePass to Android. It completely supports the, the KeePass file format. Uh, it supports the YubiKey encryption decryption. And it also, so it, it also ha handles database conflicts quite well. So for example, if, if you're sharing your database file on, the, on a cloud storage and and you access it from your, of course, computer or phone. If you change it on your computer and it's still loaded on your phone, then KeePass will say, you know, database file has changed, do you want to reload it? And if you've already made it made local changes on the Android, it's not going to simply remove them, it's going to merge both of the changes together. So that's pretty good. And um, in order in order to be able to use YubiKeys with uh, KeePass to Android, you need to have this extra library called YKDroid that essentially handles YubiKey's challenge response mode, which is what I explained earlier about how the, how the decryption key gets uh, gets created for the database. As for iOS, I personally have iOS, so I haven't used this, but the, the recommended application is Strongbox, which is also supposed to be completely compliant with the KeyPass standard. I would, I would also like to, make, uh, to, to mention the MicroG project, which is uh, something I really like. Now, I currently use a, a Huawei P40 phone, so that's uh, Huawei's first phone, which comes without any Google apps or Google services. And uh, essentially I realized that pretty much every app, no matter how related they are to anything Google, they still require Google services for pretty much everything. Right? Pretty much every app that requires location is written to only support Google's proprietary location provider from, from Google services, which is pretty stupid in my opinion, because you, you don't need this to determine my location. Obviously you can have it as a convenience feature, but why would you completely require it? And so MicroG is, uh, is, is a system level re-implementation of, of Google's proprietary services that is, is, is supposed to look and, and it, it's supposed to look like Google's, not, Google's own proprietary services in front of other applications so that they're supposed to, so that, that, so that they can actually run without having any proprietary Google services. So um, I, I haven't tested that myself because my phone is, uh, uh, bootloader locked, so I can't root it, I can't install MicroG. But lots of people have tried it and it, it seems to work for the majority of cases, so that's pretty promising. So, so far I've made essentially also most, mostly focused about the generic things like email, context, tasks. But the, our digital life comprises of, of, of many other things. Of course, we have documents, we have uh, folder albums, we have personal projects, and we have lots of different resources which are either scattered on some random files and, some random computers, or as or or, or as scattered on some random online platform somewhere else there. And I would really like to find an, an easy centralized way where I can organize every piece of information that is of value to me, so that I don't have to remember that yeah I, I have this Trello board that is related to this hackathon project, and the actual hackathon project is on GitHub, and the actual hackathon project submission. They, they execute the combine the compiled binary, for example, is, is is in this random folder and on my laptop. I would really like to find an, an easy to use centralized way where I can I can keep track of all these resources, and 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 they can actually be grouped together the way they're supposed to be grouped together. 
And so I've been, ex I, I, I've been exploring different cloud storage solutions uh, to do this. And so first I will present the best cloud storage solution that I, I, I have found myself in, in terms of software and adapters and clients. And then I'll tell you how did, how did I actually found a way to arrange all of my digital data in, in a consistent folder structure such that it is, ex it is extensible and it, 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 and it also supports pretty much every piece of information that is of value to me. So this, this actually took most of my time to, to research for the past years is finding an adequate desktop cloud syncing client. There are too many of them and many of them claim to work and many of them actually work to some degree, but most of them don't really work well when your drive is, for example, some terabytes in size and which is what happens if you're trying to upload every piece of information that is of value to you somewhere else is that obviously it cannot be downloaded or synchronized directly to your computer because it's going to be too large. And so when uh, I was looking for a desktop syncing client, which allows me to mount my cloud drive such that I can still instantly and easily access any particular file I want to and support in, 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 a, in a syncing client that of course supports end-to-end -end encryption such that uh, of course the particular cloud provider that I'm using shouldn't really be able to access anything about my data. And lastly, it should, it should support cache. So the most frequently used files or folders or anything else could easily be stored as, as, as a cache on my computer that is of course adequately and frequently re refreshed, but it's still cached such that I don't have to send requests to the cloud drive every time I'm, I'm trying to open my, the folder I've opened 15 times today already. And the client which I found to get most of this way through is Arclone. Our, our clone is a pretty big project in, in, in terms of cloud synchronization. It's, it is very modular and very extensive. What I mean by that is that it, it has adapters for pretty much any cloud storage that you may have heard of. Uh, of course, Google Drive, OneDrive, and all the other um, cloud storage providers. But it also supports end-to-end -end encryption. It also supports caching and is completely it's completely cross-platform. So far, so good. Um, and um, yeah, the biggest problem I've been having with our clone is currently its implementation of, of caching is, is not particularly good. And they're trying to re-implement re it via VFS caching right now, because it, it used to be written in a, in a different way before. And right now, the, the, there, isn't, there really isn't, is, isn't, isn't a caching solution that works reliably well, such that I can simply recommend it and say, you know, this is, this, this is what gets the job done and forget it about. So right now, sometimes uh, you, may, you may incur some data loss with, with caching and, and sometimes um, it may not cache the things you want, it, you, you want it to cache. So if you are curious about the project and you want to contribute, I think this is a, a pretty important area you can contribute to. As for Android, I said that this is completely cross-platform. So RCX is, is a wrapper for Arclone. So it, it simply uses the Arclone binary plus adapters to native Android APIs such that you can access your cloud storage on, on the Android. Um, it works pretty well. Um, if, if I have to be really picky about this, it's currently not implemented. Uh, it currently hasn't fully implemented the all, all the Android storage APIs. So it's uh, not that convenient to use yet, but it's pretty convenient and it simply gets the job done. That's pretty good. So, so far I've said about how to actually set up cloud storage. But there's a bigger question than that. And in particular, how do you actually manage all of, of your information in one central location? And I have experimented with many, with, uh, many different things. But uh, one thing I realized is that there's simply one core property that I want my storage system to have. And that is, I have resources, like files, like you can call them files, resource, whatever. But for any resource that may be of value to me, such as a photo document or something else, for any, anything that I may want to store in my storage system, it, it has to have a predetermined place. And that place should be really easy to, to, find, to figure out, such that even if I don't know if I store, if I, if I store this resource, I can very simply check this location. If, if it's not there, it shouldn't be anywhere else. So as long as this property holds, then the, your storage system can be arbitrarily large and it, it, it will be completely fine because you'll always be able to find the thing you're looking for. 
and that's a pretty pretty pretty, pretty cool property that I have been trying to somehow get by by finding the perfect uh, folder structure that can or, or that, that can arrange everything. But um, it should, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of obvious, but I don't think there's a single folder structure that simply gets the job done for absolutely any piece of information in, in, in the world. But a pretty good, more abstract solution that I found is, is the following. So forget everything about folders or uh, file systems or how, how, how this actually works. Let's, let's talk about a lot more abstractly. So we have different resources. For example, I have this hackathon project, I have this medical record, for example, and I would like to be able to store these somewhere and to easily access them whenever I need them. And so I set up a system of tags. So a tags are particular labels, that a set of labels that I put on any particular resource. These labels are without any particular order, but simply say that this resource relates to this label. And I need to have a very uh, consistent system on what labels I have and, 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 if, and, and, the, and therefore which resources need to be labeled with, with this particular label. So I can have label events, for example, and any resource that is related to events should be labeled with events, such as a hackathon submission, for example. I could also have the label, this particular hackathon name, for example, Hack Zurich is, is the last hackathon that I went to. And so I could also put the tag Hack Zurich on, on, on this resource as well. And I can also put the tag project on this resource as well because it, it is a project. And so once I, once I define all the tags that I, I, I want to place, I simply arrange all, uh, I, I simply tag all my resources. And why, why I'm trying to do this is because it actually helps me a lot with, with searching for resource base. Because once you know the tags I have, I can simply filter by them and say, okay, if I want all the projects I have, I can simply filter by tag projects. It's going to give me my hackathon submission. It's going to give me all the other side projects, which are not hackathon submissions, for example. Whereas if I'm looking for events, it's going to give me all, all the hackathon submissions or all the hackathon photos or every, everything else that I have tagged under events. And that's pretty convenient. But of course, um, we're, we're living in, in, in a world where folders are the default way to organize stuff. And um, a having a folder structure is a lot more restrictive than, than having tags and resources, which is a lot more abstract and a lot more fluid way to organize information. And but we st but I still had to make a folder structure because pretty much every software is, is written to work with the folder structure. And so I, ca I, I came up with, with this solution that still still keeps the idea of having tags, but also works in a folder structure. And it's it's kind of semi semi efficient, but it's not that efficient compared to the more abstract idea that I just shared, but it still gets the job done. So how it works is that I still have folders and um, every folder is related to every particular tag. So I can have the top level folder events for the tag events. And then within that, I can have the particular hackathon. Within that, I can have, for example, my hackathon submission or my particular document. And um, how, how, how this is actually arranged is I have I have a particular order of tags, let's say precedence of tags. So if some piece of resource has a tag event, for example, which is the highest precedence tag in, the, in this example, then it must be placed in that, in that folder. No matter what other tags it has, it must be placed in that folder. And then it must be placed in, in, all, in other folders recursively based on the other tags as well. Of course, first always taking the, the, the highest priority tag. And so what happens is that if events is, 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 high, is higher priority than documents, then obviously if I, if I have a document related to an event, it's going to be placed within events documents. And if I have a document, if I have a document which is not related to an event, then it's simply going to be placed in documents. So this folder structure still works because as long as I know my tags, as, as, as long as I know the order of my tags, I can still easily find what I'm looking for. So if I'm looking for a hackathon document, then I know it, it must be in events, it must be in, 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 it must be in also documents as well within, within events. But if I simply open documents, of course, I, I won't be able to filter for all the documents in my folder structure because they are simply scattered around everywhere because I don't have a single folder that, that, that contains all, all the documents, for example. Uh, unlike what I would have been able to in, 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 in my last example. So in this case, it, it, it kind of becomes a bit more fr fragmented and it's more difficult to search for resources. 
but it's, it still works. And I think it will be interesting to create a, an open source project here. Maybe it could be, it could be a file system or maybe it could be a, an, a file explorer that would, would also allow me to, to filter for documents and it would actually show all, all the document folders around. Uh, and, and, and if you know any open source projects that can do the, that can get that can get the job done, just tell me during the Q and A. What about online resources though? Because so far, I've, what I've, what I said mostly applies to local files, and that's easier to organize because we already have them. But like I said, we we we, we have arbitrarily GitHub repos, we have these Trello boards or whatever other online accounts or resources you may have, and I would still like to place links to these resources within my folder structure because again this is my central location for information that is of value to me so every information that is of value to me should be there and so i couldn't find a standard compliant url file type like a file that you can make and when you open it it opens the browser with that particular url but there's an interesting trick i found which is uh if you use this html file template uh, and you can use the method tag to redirect uh, to a particular URL. And once you save this text as, as an HTML file and you place it in your folder structure, once you open this HTML file, it's going to open that URL. So that way, it's, it's a workaround, but it still works. You can, you can link to your online resources and it's fine. So that was, most fun. That was essentially my talk so far. Um, I'm very thankful that you uh, stayed till the end of ArtConf. Um, and um, here, here, here are my contact details. I, I would really love if you, I mean, I'll be very happy if you manage to get um, some bit of value from my research or from my uh, side hobby so far. And uh, yeah, yeah, have a great day. Awesome. Thank you for a fantastic talk, Spesden. I am uh, I'm secret and I'll be asking the questions. Uh, there's quite a few today, actually. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, I'll just crack on. Uh, there's quite a few to get through. Um, Peter Strudel asks, I've never heard of Mailbox, but no mention of ProtonMail or Tutanota. They also support PGP. Yeah, so uh, I, I mentioned ProtonMail Pro later in the talk. Tutanota is fairly similar in terms of that they also have a pretty major privacy focus, but they're based in Germany, which is, of course, in the 14 eyes. So that's a downside for some people, whereas ProtonMail is, of course, Swiss. Um, the thing about ProtonMail and Tutanota is that they are very privacy heavy. And so they're trying to re, um, rebuild most of the uh, email slash calendar slash contact task infrastructure uh, on them. And of course, one, uh, when, when this whole process finishes, m maybe they will be convenient enough to, to use for general public. But right now, for example, I think uh, either it's right now or, or, or up until very recently, you still can't do full text search within the content of, of your problem mail emails. Whereas uh, generally, generally, lots of features aren't implemented yet, and it's simply not as convenient. But of course, if you value the privacy, go for it. Awesome. Uh, Steamrack asks, it's a question along the very similar vein. Steamrack yeah. asks, did you look into the differences between mail mailbox.org and ProtonMail? Yeah. Um, well, first, ProtonMail is a, bit, a, little, a little bit more expensive. Uh, the country data location, of course. Uh, but still, um, ProtonMail tries to re-implement everything. And for example, uh, their context app and their, and their calendar app, you can't really synchronize, the, synchronize this with, with your local calendar frontend on Android. So you just have to use their app, which of course, for, uh, for example, still up until very recently, for example, didn't support recurring events or they're simply re-implementing re all of the features that we, we, we have gotten accustomed to. Right, I see. Uh, another question from Steamrack. Why do you prefer to use mailbox.org for email hosting instead of running your own server? So the thing about running your own server is that if you don't do it well enough, you may easily get into everybody's spam boxes, which is why I simply wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it for convenience sake. But of course, for, for more privacy and if you're willing to run the risk of sending a very critical email, which may get thrown away at any, at any point in time, you could definitely post it yourself. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Ramsey asks, have you tried GitLab for projects and Trello-like boards? I mean, uh, I haven't used GitLab for Trello-like boards per se, but I'm not sure how, like, do they provide any encryption overall or do they provide anything else that may be of value to, 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 to our privacy topic right now? 
But I, I mean, with GitLab, you can self host. So I, I don't know if the free self hosted version gives you project boards, but I think that that would be the, yeah. the intent of that question is to self host it. Yeah, I mean, I would try it myself. I just use GitLab for Git. Right. Um, A. Bowman asks Have you ever considered a plain old folder with rsync or unison? Of course, I, I expected to get some some more uh, uh, questions of this type. You know, have you just tried to do the, the, more, the most basic primitive thing instead of the more complicated thing? Right. The thing is, if if uh, for example, organizing your calendar in a, in a text file works for you, then it's, it's, go ahead. But the the problem with, for example, rsync is that it's it's simply not it's it's a technology whose purpose is, is not to do that. It's a, it's if for example, its purpose is to synchronize. One, one state on one machine to another state on another machine. But if I, if, I, if I had this huge cloud drive that's like 10 terabytes and I have my mobile phone that I would like to access everything within that drive easily and in an encrypted way that, and, and it still gets to cache my most frequently used files then our thing simply won't get the job done. And yeah, I mean, it could work, but it's simply not, I, I don't think that's the right tool for the job. Right. I mean, you, you could argue like our thing could be used as a, as a transport layer for some larger yeah, yeah. application maybe i mean our clone was inspired by our thing essentially that's why it, it's it's in, it's in the name but it's it's completely independent in terms of technology right uh infra prado i hope i pronounced that right asks have you looked into tmsu it ena it enables you to tag files i'm not sure of the context of that question yeah, uh, it's, it's 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 from the last slides where i was, where I was talking about uh folder instructions and stuff like that i actually right. don't know about Yes, I'm used uh, a TMS use. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll look into it. Could be interesting. Cool. And next up, we have a question by Kieto. Oh, sorry, by Rock6. Um, why not hosting Nextcloud on a VPS? That's pretty simple now with these Docker things. Yeah, and actually, that's a that's a pretty good solution, honestly. Um, the reason, the, the the only reason why I did not recommend it is because again you have to self-host things which this case in this case it's, it's not an email server so you don't really run the risk of ruining uh your work essentially but you still have to rent the server somewhere else and obviously if if, if you're renting a vps on some arbitrary location then you have to trust them that they're not accessing your data and um and etc and it, it's simply not that simple to set up but of course if, if you if you have your own nas somewhere at, at home and you, you would like to use it then certainly that's that's a good solution but then again what if your power dies out and then you, you, you're you somewhere in the Philippines and that, that's over. Yeah. So that's why I, I, I would personally simply get some reliable cloud, cloud hosting from a big company and just encrypt everything. Yeah, and, and the next question from Kiato is basically the same as have you thought about or tried a self-hosted nice cloud instance? I guess uh, there's an argument to be made, I guess, by like self-hosting, hosting next cloud for other people, right? Like you're, your family or your less technologically inclined yeah. friends or whatever, like providing them a service using the technological ability that you have is kind of a, an approach you could take. That would certainly be a lot easier for them because they, otherwise they don't have to them themselves set up the, the more complicated technology, such as add sync or the other uh, text, which I, which I recommended in this bed. And they could simply install the content and then connect to the next color server. So yeah. That's a decent solution, but of course, it had the job box. Uh, Amin Vakil, Amin Vakil asks, "What protocols does Arclone use?" So I'm not sure what you exactly mean by protocol. So Ar Ar Arclone is a client application that simply has many different adapters to the native APIs for the different cloud providers. So it's it's it simply uh, creates a common interface between all all these providers and. Then, it, then it, it 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 also reuses that common interface for encryption or for other more complicated uh, things like chunking and caching and stuff like that, which is pretty convenient. Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, and Peter Strudel asks, just a comment. You could look at r slash data curator on Reddit. I'm not sure what r slash data curator is. Yeah, it's a separate for something. I haven't heard of it, but thank you. I'll take a look at it. And finally, Vakholdaba Vakhold, asks, late comment, join too late, so maybe it's not what you're looking for, but maybe perkeep.org is what you're looking for? I don't know what perkeep is. I actually know about perkeep, and I have I have tried to look into it, and I um, tried to set it up, but the thing is, it's still under active development, 
and it looked like many key features are still missing out. So I may be wrong. And if you if you know if you know something else, just do tell me. But um, it did not. I mean, I I don't I don't remember the exact reasons I had back in the tank in the tank. This was like a year ago or something. But I didn't have the impression that it simply uh, was functional enough to get the job done. Right. It looked Sorry. like uh, simply a storage for photos that has version history or something else. But I, I think I may have completely forgotten. Right. That was going to be my follow up question is as someone who's never heard of Perkeep, if you could like give it a, 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 a five second summary. But I guess he, you already did that. Um, this, these text next two questions or comments, I guess, don't have a, don't have a, an asker subscribe to them. For Proton Mail, they have a Linux bridge and you can use it with Thunderbird IIRC. Also, Nextcloud has boards too. Yeah, the, the Proton Mail bridge is actually quite useful. And I think that it's, it, it essentially solves a big part of the problems that the native normal Pro Proton Mail client has in terms of missing features. I haven't tested it myself personally to know exactly to, to, to what extent it actually uh, functions as, 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 as a native um, um, SMTP slash IMAP. Uh, server because the problem mail bridge is something that simply is self-hosts uh, such a mail server on, on, on your computer, such a mail client on your computer, such that you can actually access it from a pro from from the boat or or, or whatever. Um, I I I didn't really know that. I mean, I I, did, I didn't particularly know that Nextcloud had boards, but it, it looked like yeah, it had lots of lots of features, so it, it may have boards too. In in which case, maybe it it, it will be a good idea to use it. To, uh, yeah. All right. And oh, nice. We've got a, we've got a follow up question which I really like uh, from Peter Strudel. Is it possible to DIY YubiKey? Is YubiKey a standard physical token, or can someone do their own? That's a great question. I, um, the thing that I don't like about most recent YubiKeys is that their firmware is actually proprietary. To their crypto libraries that became proprietary quite recently, and uh, of course that may open open the door to some problems well uh, but whether it is actually completely standard compliant whether like somebody else can completely uh, create a UB, UB key i'm not really sure what protocol they use to communicate with the computer but they support pretty, pretty basic features like uh, um they support time-based so one time password generation they support uh, uh they implement the standard for uh, a, a, a pgp smart card so i guess that's something that you can easily uh re-implement something else and um, they also like the the thing that actually YubiKey also um, like the, the 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 default function of a of a YubiKey that um, simply creates more time passwords. That's it's it's not time based, but it's 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 a password that has that your your client application once it receives that password, it has to verify very, very it against YubiKey servers to see if 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 it is, if it is actually valid or not. I think that. Is, is 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 also defined as a protocol, so you could create your own YubiKey server that you, that may work with this kind of encryption and 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 still authenticate. And for example, Mailbox have actually done this. So Mailbox uh, actually have their own uh, implement uh, their own instance of a of a YubiKey authentication server. So you can buy YubiKey from them, and it will it will be authenticated by them instead of by YubiKey if you don't want to trust them because they're in America, of course. Right. Huh. I wasn't aware of YubiKey phoning home to their servers to to check for, for verification. But I mean, yeah, there are you know the the the, the primary protocols that they use U2F and and, and Fido and and then also yeah the PGP shit and 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 everything like that. They're mostly open, and a couple of people have mentioned uh, Solo Key or Nitro Key as, as alternatives. But you're right. As of as of I think YubiKey three or I think it's four. Uh, yeah, they stopped publishing there their firmware as free software, which is certainly it's problematic when you're using a, yeah, when you're using a security centric product. I, I, like my YubiKey is old enough for it to be open source, but I, I really wouldn't use any of the recent ones. So if, if the one, the alternatives that you recommend is solo key and nitro key actually work, then, you know, yeah, just, just use them. And I think I remember a project at one of the congresses of, of um, vaguely to the effect of soldering your own YubiKey was, was I think the general concept of the talk. Yeah, that awesome. be and that is uh that is oh no there's uh <laughs> there's one final question if we can if we can answer it real quickly what's next for your system what do you think about doing next or what doesn't currently spark joy 
I said not answered on the stream. I'm very confused. Um, I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, okay because we got to get to the outro talk. So this was the final talk of, uh, of ArchCon yeah. 2020. Yeah, so thank you for being part of it. And I will hand over to, to the rest of the guys. Thank you very thank much. You. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.